Nine drops by nine are eighty-one. Eighty-one clouds shall bring me rain. The rain shall fall, the land shall smile, and the water will flow for quite a while. And I had to like get one drop of dew, one drop of tap water, one drop of rainwater. Sorry, did you just make this up? Do you got it? I can't believe it's purple. Oh my god, oh my god, it's purple. <laughs> it's like your perfect drink. I was like, oh, I'm getting the classy one. I know, and I, I thought was that like, was mine. No, you got the classy one. <laughs> okay. I just got the... Okay, one that, ooh. <laughs> Great start. Don't pour it. Okay, so, so... you're just saying you want to own a horse farm? Yes. So like when I was a kid, my dad, um, he was like moving around all the time. And so he was like in Boston and then Cape Cod. And so for like the summers when I would visit him for like six weeks, we would go to Cape Cod. And I didn't really want to hang out with him. So I like, I would like beg, beg him to let me um, do this like horse farm camp thing. And I like went double the amount of time that a normal person would go. So like I would do the morning one and the afternoon one. So I was just there from like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day, except like the weekend. And so I was like, for like every summer, for like eight years. So I like was a full horsey girl during the summer. And then I'd go back to the city and be like the cool New York girl. <laughs> and no one knew my second life. But I was like, no, <laughs> like Hannah no Montana. One. I literally, the Hannah Montana movie I related like really heavily to. <laughs> But I really, I really wanted like the, the hot blonde guy in it. Anyway, anyway. You've always had the entrepreneurial spirit. No, yeah. I like, for my like college essay to uh, NYU, I like, I like wrote out a business plan for, yeah, my music and, and like being a pop star. It was like, I acted as if it was like a business and I mean it is, but, but I actually feel like starting just like eight months ago when my first single came out was like really the first time I started my career because like mm. it was like the second that song came out it was like I actually had no idea what was going on and it was just like up until then it was just like reading a textbook of the music industry yeah. Yeah. and like I had a real grasp on a lot of things but like I have just learned everything I feel like completely differently and like for the first time pretty much. Well that's but, like that's something that people come up to you and they're like oh yeah. God, you're only 22 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I'm like but I think it's amazing what can happen when you, I don't know if I told you this, but I, I write a lot and I tend to write like, you know, as an undergrad, my major was freaking biochemistry and voice. So I used to have to write like all the little science, <laughs> science things in papers. Well, when I got to grad school, I started writing like the more music articles. And there was one article that this journal asked me to write about um, a conductor who is monaural, so like deaf in one ear. Wow. And at one point, you know, she told me her story about how she woke up literally one day and she had just sudden hearing loss. She just couldn't hear out of her ear. And she had this like massive concert with a, a bunch of her, her students that she was supposed to have. And she was panicked yeah. because she was like, what am I supposed to do? Like, I cannot hear out of this one ear. I'm losing my mind. Do I cancel? Do I not do this? And she decided to push through it and do it. And she told me this quote, it says, take the leap and the net will always appear. And I think that maybe sometimes that's used just to convince ourselves to take a risk. But the universe has a funny way of working things yeah. out. Yeah. And sometimes, even though the decision seems scary, like the decision to not go to school anymore, or the decision to move to New York City and yeah. forfeit your doctoral degree, yeah. um, it's, it's so rewarding. Terrifying. Yeah. Absolutely terrifying. There's no doubt about it, but so rewarding. Yeah. Well, yeah, so like the, like me dropping out and stuff. And I think like, I guess I've only been out of school for like six months officially. I feel like I can honestly teach a class at this point. You could. Which is crazy, but. <laughs> and it's interesting what you were saying about like the, um, looking into the real world, right? And working in the real world versus going to school. You know, some people operate under the, the guise that you can create music Um, and through creating music, you have fun. And I think that's true for some things. Yeah. But I tend to think 
that you can have fun and have a joyful process, and you'll also learn music, right? And I think it can be a similar experience for when you're like recording in a studio or something, right? You have a product that you that you have an idea or something you want to try, and I think a large part of it is just trying, yeah. like just taking a risk and trying things out and seeing how they sound and being and being willing to fuck up. Being willing to make mistakes, yeah. um, because honestly, I think that's how we get our our greatest ideas. Yeah. Recently, I was like recording the song "Pink Noise," and it was like, well, so I made this like one song, "Love Sick in Public," you know, mm -hmm. and I felt like that was like my most like risky song. <laughs> Sorry, I was just just like, Love. it's great. <laughs> but. And now I'm like constantly like trying to want to beat it and like push myself to like because it's it's not even that crazy. It's like just a it's normal not. song, right? Well, it's not normal. No, I know, but like it's, it's not but like normal. yeah. But it's just because like I was just doing stuff like line and like very I don't know like intimate pop music and whatever and like just even like finding that register in my voice was really exciting. And so like the song Pink Noise was just like it was a lot of like kind of acting and it was like. Just like I had to be really confident. Like the whole um, song is about like feminine rage and pink noise being like a metaphor for that. I know. <laughs> like, You're like gearing up. No, let's literally. go. And it's like, yeah, it's just this very, just like fun and like a kind of exploding of like feminine power and and um, it was just like really interesting doing that in like a low range and like low register where it was just a lot of like speaking, you know? I think one of the lyrics is like, under glitter there's rage, there's just no other way to make them listen, which is like men and whatever. And anyway, <laughs> I just like remember, whatever. which is like, <laughs> which is, like yeah, men or whatever, whatever, just to listen. <laughs> and I'm just like, I just said that, I said that line so many times and only when I like stopped fucking caring, yeah. you know? And I just like kind of, yeah, I just like became this really like attitudinal, like teen angsty girl. And there's like this one, uh, this one line in the bridge that was like, um, like tighten our skirt until we can't breathe, and then I go like, ah, ah. <laughs> I like make this really weird, like I can't breathe sound. Was that born out of anything, or? Yeah, in high school I used to like, I mean, I never really had an eating disorder, which I'm thankful for, but like, I just like would skip lunch if I felt like I was just like a little bit oh, too, no. oh, you know what I mean? We're Nick territory. <laughs> Oh no, <laughs> or nor. Um, but yeah, I would just like skip lunches and just like wear the tightest fucking clothing, the highest heels, and I just felt like my value as a person in society just like constantly went up. The higher the heel, the tighter the skirt, whatever. And recently, like I think, I don't know when it happened, but I like bought my first pair of Pumas in like I think like eleventh grade, and I like just Pumas. Stop Pumas oh, specifically. Those are the thing. No those right. Were the thing. <laughs> no right. Yes. It's like every bitch like had a fucking shoes, puma. puma. <laughs> or the, oh my gosh, uh, Osiris shoes. Yeah, yeah. Those, those high top, yeah. those big clunky high top yeah. shoes. Jeez. Yeah. But yeah, no, once the sneakers went on, yeah. I was never going back. And now I only wear like platforms and sneakers. I'm just not breaking my ankle anymore. I'm not doing it. And now I feel like really cool and hot and, you know, I started like. You are. Thanks, babe. <laughs> you too. Thank you. <laughs> It's hard yeah. to come to that conclusion too. And yeah. it, it takes a lot of reflecting. Um, so terrible. That's it's a lovely drink. <laughs> you're I'm you're sipping it says I'm already halfway down, but I got this whole other fucking Well that's true, you got a whole thing of time. I keep right. refilling it. Just keep diluting it. <laughs> right. That's what you need to do. Yes. Um it's interesting what you're talking about in terms of constricting yourself through your appearance. Yeah. You can see it was the opposite for me. Because no one ever, this is going to sound more drastic than it is. All right. No All one right. ever, no one really ever said I was beautiful or Whoa. handsome. You know, in, you know, in high school. Crazy. That's also a hard time, right? That's just a hard yeah. time in general. So I think I tried to find my, my self-worth through my intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. And that was <laughs> kind of a curse, I think. Yeah. Because you can only one, push your brain so far until it's burned out. I was consistently burned out. And you know, you're talking about this idea of an eating disorder. I don't, I didn't, it was never diagnosed with an eating disorder, but I would do the same thing where I would try to control, I felt like I had no control in my life 
So I want to control what I was eating. Yeah. And what that meant was not eating. And then I would come home at 10 p.m. at night after my, you know, 9.30 ending physics 2 class at Macomb Community College. And um, I would sit on the couch. I would grab all of the snacks that I could upstairs. And I would sit on the couch for three, two or three hours until 1 a.m. And I would just eat junk food. Like, and I find myself... Yeah. I loved McDonald's. <laughs> yes, it's like it's so, so easy yeah. and convenient and like I felt like garbage, honestly, yeah. because I didn't know it at the time, but I just felt so unworthy and um, I guess unworthy of love and affection because everybody had told me that I was intelligent and that I was smart and that was great, um, but I, I was never told I was like the pretty, you know, pretty boy. Like, you know, girls didn't seek me out to date me. It's also because I'm queer as hell. But I mean, right? Like, it's you would have sought me out. But um, it wasn't until honestly I moved here. So, I mean, it sounds so funny, but um, where I started like wearing jewelry again yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, just being able to dress in a way that didn't feel either incredibly formal yeah. um, or restrictive. Like, but okay, but. I had this other realization the other day too. Okay. Because like, because I've always had like, if I dress up, I feel confident, whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, sometimes I'm like, why don't I feel as confident when I'm just mm. stripped back and like, oh, no. you know what I mean? I feel like I feel like I feel like that when I'm naked. We're about to <laughs> but, unpack this at the stable. No, we're, about, we're unpacking those right now. <laughs> Let's go. All right. No, but like, but I've been exploring that mm -hmm. and like trying to focus on skincare and like uh, other things that like highlight. Washing our face. A washing concept. our face. <laughs> no, but like, I don't know, like just anything that, yeah, is like not me putting on makeup or, hmm. yeah, like, like stuff that I feel like flatters my body in the way that I'm more stereotypically like attracted to or something like. I, like wearing more masculine clothes and still feeling as beautiful. That's like a new thing for me because I am, yeah, like discovering my bi side and just like being into women and stuff. And like, I know. You just threw that out there. It's okay. It's a I thing it. now. It's good. As it should be. As no, it right. should be. And I, I remember my friend Yasha telling me, yeah, just like kind of smiling at me, just like looking at me when I was like wearing this like very masculine outfit. Okay. And they were like, Something's different. <laughs> like, like, what's going on? And I, and I, like, just felt as confident as, as usual. Like, even in like a fancy cocktail dress or something, you know. And I still felt as like beautiful and powerful. And that was like really, really, really cool. And even today. Even today. Even you look today. Fabulous. <laughs> and you're generally, you generally got like the I know. four necklaces. Oh yes. <laughs> it's, it's great. <laughs> And see, I wish I could wear, well, I probably could wear more of that. Um, yeah, you could. Any, anyone can. Literally anyone. Yes. Anyone looks right. slay with it, more. With more. Um, I just find that, like, in New York City, I can definitely, you know, oh, yeah. be like this, do this, wear this. I mean, this is even quite simple for me, overall. But um, in the world that I come from, uh, especially growing up, like, in a, oh, this sounds so stereotypical, but it's true. Um, I never ever actually talked about like where yeah. I grew up, but I grew up in a place called Romeo, Romeo, Michigan. Yeah. Um, it's uh, an hour and 15 minutes north of Detroit, although a million miles away. Like growing up in that area and being a queer yeah. teen that fully was not out at all, even though I was like. At the same time, I was, you know, in the theater program. I was the lead in every musical, you know, played like. It's giving Kurt from Glee. It's giving Kurt from Glee. Yes, like I was, you know, the Danny Zuko and all that yeah. sort of thing, and like trying to be as like masculine as possible, right? Whatever that meant. But I was like, eh, right? Right. Than... <laughs> so, but I, I feel like part of my um, identity is now in my clothing because when I was doing that stuff, like I said, I was just very like. Loose fitting clothing, something that didn't complement my body because I didn't like it um, at all. Right? Like, yeah. I didn't like it at all, so I didn't want people to be able to see what it looked like. Um, and even when I remember there was a time where, when I was playing Danny Zuko in Greece, and there's that one scene where they're like running on the track or whatever, and they had to wear like um, really short shorts, like, and I think they're called softies. I'm right? bad, are they? <laughs> what? 
are they? That's yes, they are. Weird. It's a weird short brand that was branded for women, but I was it was like red shorts. And so I remember though it was like just just enough. Yes, just enough to cover. I think that's what it was called. Yeah. And um, I remember like going and like getting a spray tan because I didn't want people to see my pale skin. And like being super obsessive about like how my legs looked because people were seeing me for the first time. Um, and even I was obsessed with that. I used to experiment when I was growing up. I used to like steal makeup a lot. Um, you know, seriously, like literally, I used to steal makeup a lot um, and just try it. Yeah. I was very bad at it, very bad. Um, because of course, like the things I know now of like matching your skin tone. Basic principle, you would right? think. <laughs> I would like, really not too. making sure you don't grab the powder that has sparkles in it, or like unless you know things unless like that, or like cleaning the counter out. after you use the bronzer. Oh no! Right, <laughs> so things things like that, um, and I don't wear makeup like very often anymore. Rarely, yeah. rarely. Um, but my mom actually growing up used to uh, let me help her do her makeup for work. Yeah. Um, so my mom was a, an ER nurse for a very yeah. long time. Yeah. And so she used to. Uh, when she was working, sleep during the day, it's about uh, three or four o'clock. She get up, make dinner, and then she used to get ready for work because then she had to work two nights in a row. And so I would just sit there. That was like the one time I got to spend with my mom was like sitting there with my mom and like doing her makeup. Now, granted, was it good? No. I remember she used Imagine to have going like, to work, being like, yeah. My kid my put orange again. and purple eye, <laughs> eyeshadow on me today. But you know what? I'm gonna let him express himself. I'm gonna let him express himself. <laughs> And for the most part, like, my my parents, I think, knew yeah. it was just hard yeah. for them, right? Because yeah. especially for them growing up, yeah. um, they existed in a society where people like me were uh, unsuccessful because of society. Um, they were also around during the uh, HIV and AIDS epidemic, so that was, that was scary for them because they saw this whole... Uh, media thing that pushed like this gay related disease, whatever that yeah. meant, onto it, right? Not um, monkeypox becoming that. Yeah, exactly. And the oh, same thing we see it again with yeah. things like monkeypox. Yeah. But we saw the exact same thing with yeah. the AIDS epidemic, yeah. right? Where it yeah. was labeled as GRID, yeah. which is the gay related immunodeficiency disease, until they were finally like, oh, it's also in injectable drug users as well. Um, and I guess it's not just gay related, but they jumped on it. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I think for them, because they've come to accept it now, now yeah. that I'm like a fully adult, but is that um, they were scared. Yeah. I don't think they, they obviously love me and, and care for me, but they were just really scared for what my future would look like. Yeah. I think like, well, so I think like three months ago, I like came out to my mom on stage on accident. <laughs> I was like, I forgot she was in the audience. And I was like excited to play my new song and it was like, why didn't I kiss you? And it was about a girl that I like didn't want to, I, I forgot to kiss or whatever, oh, not you, forgot to kiss. I was just like freaking it. out. No, I did it. And I was like, oh, like I'm by now. And like the whole crowd's cheering and I just like see her in the back and I was like. <laughs> did she say like, anything to you? Oh. Um, like three weeks later, she was like, so have you been seeing any girls? <laughs> and I was like. Well, that's honestly the best it. transition you can have. <laughs> no, I know. Oh, and then I sang the song, and, and the girl who I was talking about was there in the audience, and then my mom was just over there, and I was like, wow, oh, what an so experience. You put yourself in a really interesting circumstances. No, I know, I know. And you know what's crazy? Because, like, some people, like, from the industry were there, too, so it was just, like, such a... There was just so many things going on in the audience from the stage. So it was, like, the girl I wrote the song about, the people, like, the A&Rs from the label that I was, like, wanting to be with or whatever. And my mom and like the people from the A&R or the A&Rs were like, oh, like you should put that out and you should like promote your bisexuality because like that'll be better for views. And then I was just like, I literally, <laughs> there's way too much going on right now. And how do you feel about it now? Um, very good. Yeah. Well, like. I know that's a thing that's been developing. Yeah. Well, I, oh, well yeah, ever like, since I met you. No, legit. I just inspired it. No, literally. I was like, here's this queer. Hey, maybe. No, literally. <laughs> Hey, wait, do I have to sneeze? Sorry. <laughs> I can't. Oh, I'm good. I'm good, I'm good. You can look at the light. That's a thing. What light? Is that a thing? <laughs> yeah. Are you, it's like the hiccup thing? 
Yeah, it's like a, you, like you look like, at a light and you sneeze. No, like look up at a It's I don't know. I don't actually know. <laughs> but I do know that at one point somebody told me to look up at a light and I sneezed. I understand that correlation does not equal causation, but in that instance, I would like to think it did. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, wait, what was I talking about? What the fuck was happening? That's a great question. No, legit, what was happening? Oh, oh, oh. No, okay, I wanted to talk to you about, like, what I've been experiencing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Oh, yeah, oh yeah. my god, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, so I was just, I was just at my friend's sleepover last night, mm -hmm. and the girl I like was there, and we were playing, like, Truth or Dare and stuff, but in a very cute oh way, God, like, not in a crazy like, way. No, 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 not in a high school way. Spin the bottle. <laughs> take a shot of Kool-Aid. <laughs> Kool-Aid? I don't know. <laughs> and, okay, so, and then one of my friends was, like, asked, an, asked another friend um, her truth, which was, like, what are you most afraid to write a song about? We all have to be artists. And immediately, Ooh. the first thing, because I had written songs about girls and whatever, but no one that I'd really, really cared about. And like, um, so I think the, the thing I'm most scared to write about is like, yeah, my feelings for like a girl that I actually truly, truly care about, which is crazy because like, what that means for me anyways is like, just like actually coming to terms with the fact that it's a thing and like having to own that. And like, I just even remember like having my first like fantasy about like actually being with a girl beyond just kissing or like beyond just like experimenting like a relationship in a future and whatever. And like to put that into a song would mean that it would be true, you know? And so like, that's the thing I'm afraid to write about. <laughs> it's the ultimate level of vulnerability. Yes, and if it's like written, it's like in the history books. And, and it's like immortalized. True. Yes, yes. It's like you can't go back on that. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's it's funny you talk about your awakening because for me my childhood is just a blur. Like, it's just like literally a blur. Yeah. But I do remember yeah. Edward Cullen. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I no, mean, it's so basic. It's, it's not Mr. Cullen. It is Mr. Cullen. Uh, freaking Robert Pattinson. Oh my god. Uh, you watching the, the Twilight movies. Twilight, and, not yes. Harry Potter. Did Harry Potter Whoa, get you? I look no, no, he never got me. He was so cute. He was all cute. Hufflepuffy. No. It's a Gryffindor. But anyway. He was in Hufflepuff. What are We're you talking about? about? Because he's literally in Hufflepuff. No, he's not. He's already not. He's, he's a Gryffindor. In you. He was in yellow you, the whole time. He was in red. He was in black and then the red emblem. He's a Gryffindor. You gotta watch your movies again. Oh my god, we know I'm Your whole life has been a lie. He is definitely not if a Hufflepuff. I got this Harry Potter thing wrong, I'm going to You be did. So you absolutely did. <laughs> it's completely oh incorrect. No, 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 but that's no, no. okay. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, wait, how much money are you willing to bet on this? Because I'm willing to bet $1,000. Okay, that is so much that money. That he is a Gryffindor. <laughs> I'm going to. Because I am that certain that you are incorrect. And that's okay. What is it was like Gryffindor? when I learned. Yes. There's no fucking way that he's a Gryffindor right now. Yeah. Well, anyway, you Wait, can look no, that up I'm later. not fucking past it, Nick. <laughs> Wait, in I what gotta... world do you think he's a Hufflepuff? In what world? I don't know. He just wears so much yellow. I just remember him like. Yeah, but think about that. Think about the hat scene, the Sorting Hat scene, where they're I all going through the little him. trials and the hats on him. Wait, you mean in the fourth? He was only in the fourth movie. Are we talking about the same person? Wait. In the fourth fucking movie. Who are we talking about? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh Wait, my god. I thought we were talking about <laughs> Harry Potter. Yeah, we are talking about. But Daniel Robert, Radcliffe. Oh, oh, I see the situation. I see the situation. I think you're right. Either no, that or Ravenclaw. Nick. I don't remember. Nick. Wait. He's, he's an awful pop. No, Nick. You're right. That's right. We were on two different pages. Wait, I thought you were talking, talking about, about Radcliffe. Well, because you said Harry Potter, so I immediately assumed Yeah, but we were talking about your first love, Sir Cullen. I can't. I literally just like... I had a heart attack thinking I got a Harry Potter thing wrong. And I was sitting here like, oh my God. wait a minute, oh my God. I have you not so watched a single hot. movie? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. I was about to win a thousand fucking dollars. <laughs> yeah, let me just pull the three dollars and crumbled singles that I have for you, and I'll give that to you. All your tips for the next week. <laughs> It'll be three dollars. Oh so God, oh anyway, um, anyway, 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 um, 
I had the, the sexual awakening with Robert Pattinson. <laughs> And then I was asked to I can't, I can't. Um, do a, we had this like, the, these like book red carpet awards okay. in middle school. Yes. And so basically what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to read the book yeah. and act like a celebrity or a character from the book. And then you would literally walk down a red carpet and give a speech. It's not the red carpet. Oh, it was wild. <laughs> and so I remember uh, dressing up as Robert Pattinson, as uh, Edward Cullen. And I had like, I remember the, it, was, it was like a gray shirt, the white t-shirt and jeans, and I had heavy eyeliner on, and I like got that white paste and put it all over my face. <laughs> and um, I didn't read the book. I didn't read the book at all. I didn't read the book at all. I mean, And here I am I. walking down the red carpet like, hey. No, but he was like an icon. No one oh. had to read the fucking book. No, to no know one did. And then I gave up there, Cullen went was. up there and gave a speech and about the book. Quote, unquote, oh, wow. It went well. <laughs> you gave a full synopsis about the book you I didn't read. I gave a full synopsis about the book I didn't read because it was Twilight and like. It was I actually did never finish the movies. Oh my god! Someone asked me on my live the other day, "Do you love Taylor Swift in Twilight?" And I was like, "Taylor Swift." Well, I don't know. It's like such a thing to like be obsessed with both of those things. Oh, Taylor Swift and, and Twilight. I you said in. No. I was like, wait a second. If I she go. was in. Twilight. I gotta go rewatch every book. Honestly, movies. she would be in Twilight. No, but. It was like both of them, and I was like, I like fully lied. I like freaked out. I was like, oh my god, my entire reputation is gonna fall apart if I say that I haven't watched the full series of Twilight right now. <laughs> but wait, I'm about to sneeze again. It's not gonna happen. You got it. I no, I like, I keep needing to sneeze, but it's like not gonna happen. It's fine. I'm chilling. I'm so chilling. How was yours? It was actually pretty good. I don't know if I can even have. Huh? Honestly, I realized, yeah, because of my one fucking pop tart and granny out, this is hitting hard. <laughs> so I had a lovely <laughs> meal before this. I was. I did meal prep before before you, coming here. Yeah, maybe you should have had two pop tarts. I know. Tarts. So cute. Look at the dog. Adorable. I know. Are you a dog person? I don't think I've ever asked you this question. Yes. Really? Have I not told you about my dog rescue experience? No! Oh my god, this is crazy. Okay, so beyond the horse thing, I either have always wanted to have a horse rescue as well or a dog rescue. Mm -hmm. So I, hello! Hello. Hi! <laughs> He's like, I, I want, love him. they're like, I want it, but I know. I'm a little He's scared. Like, I get it. I get it. I sympathize. <laughs> so, okay. So, I used to work at Muddy Paws Rescue for like multiple years. I started rescue? Muddy Paws Rescue. Muddy Paws. Yes. Yes. Adorable. I just saw their ad in like Chelsea Pierce and I was like, oh my God. Or no, Chelsea Pierce. Oh, it's NYC? Yeah. So, it's oh. like a, it's a fully foster based um, rescue in the city. Now, but it's easy again. It's not happening. Oh no, literally, I feel all of a sudden it's like all of the down feathers are back in my body. Okay, anyway. So yeah, Muddy Paws Rescue is a fully foster-based um, rescue in, in the city. And I went to this like Adopt-a-Palooza event in Union Square in high school, naturally. I was like at my ex-boyfriend's and I like saw it out the window and I was like, goodbye. <laughs> I like left and I just like hung out with all the dogs the whole day. And I was like, mom, we have to sign up for fostering. So we became fosters and we fostered probably I think like 18 different dogs and stuff. So I did that for years. <laughs> I just, and I stopped doing that like six months ago because I just couldn't balance it all with Kava Bar and, and the music because it was all volunteer work, it was free. So I couldn't justify it anymore, but but yeah, so I love animals. I'm like such an animal person. That makes so much sense to me. I know. <laughs> because you're such a kind person. Uh, okay, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, what is like, like a more serious and meaningful, and then a more goofy moment in which you'll feel like you have like made it in your career. Yeah. A more serious and a more goofy yeah. that I made it. I think the more serious. Um, seriously, the more serious would be invited to conduct something. Um, I know it sounds. Uh, trivial, yeah. but having someone ask you to come and conduct a performance would be it for me. I mean, honestly, no matter where it is, like I've, I've thought, and that's funny you asked me because every time 
I find a new answer for that because yeah. at first I was like, oh, I know I've made it if I got into grad school. Or I know I've made it if I got to present at the conference. Yeah, well. And I, I was like, check, check. No, I made it if I got to write an article, right? We're at number three. Like, it's, I've done that point. It was kind of the thing we were talking about earlier, like these slopes of things. And I think now it's like, I want to be um, established as a true conductor. I don't yeah. know what that means. Um, oh my god, I can't wait. And then I'll just like come to every show and be like, <laughs> You wave those hands, Nick. <laughs> well, because there's a, and I've actually been talking about this a lot recently. Yeah. I don't know why, but I've been talking about a lot the difference between, or this, I would say, there's a stigma that kind of exists between choral and orchestral conductors, or band, or also band conductors, choral, orchestral, and band. And there tends to be an interpretation of my field that we're somehow less serious than orchestral conductors. Yeah. Right, and I really, I really wish that wasn't true. Yeah. Um, because there are so many opportunities. Like, I would love to be invited to, and I think this is what your question was, but to invited to conduct an orchestra. Because I think that would be like the moment I knew I made it as a conductor. Yeah. Period. Yeah, because yeah, then yeah. no one's questioning whether I have skill to conduct a choir versus an orchestra versus a band versus whatever it is. But I think sometimes choral conductors are like. Into, oh, this is going to get into an ethereal place. Interpret it as these, I'm like, ready. I'm ready. you know, like dancing gestures and like gestures that don't really mean anything. And then, you know, like orchestral conductors are like the yes, 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 people the that have these, like, very precise, you know, gestures like this. But it's so interesting to me because I know I'm going on a tangent now. I go am, on your tangent, okay, Nick. I'm, I'm so tangent. excited for you. So the reason I wanted to be a conductor is because I thought dead ass that I was a wizard when I was growing up. Like, fully I love it. I was a wizard. I love it. I'll tell you my origin story. When I moved into our new house, Romeo, Michigan, um, we were having a housewarming party. And you know, the mom invited all the friends over and we had some family there. And I was walking around one of the, the mom's friend or mom's kids. And I had my little spell book with me, like walking around outside. It was already dreary. It was already very dark. And I was like, I'm gonna do a rain spell. Like, and now in hindsight, I'm like, I knew it was yeah, gonna okay, rain. Yeah, okay, waterbender. I was okay. like, oh, I love, oh, don't even get me started. Don't even get me started. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'm gonna make it rain. So, are you ready for the spell? Nine drops by nine are 81. 81 clouds shall bring me rain. The rain shall fall, the land shall smile, and water will flow for quite a while. And I had to like get one drop of dew, one drop of tap water, one drop of rain, rain water. Sorry, did you just make this up? No, that was oh. the spell. Wait, but like from the Google? To my spell book. Oh, <laughs> like a legit spell book? Yes! <laughs> so I had a legit spell book that I was like, I am a wizard. I used to make my friends drink potions in the backyard. So I would have like dirt and it's a whole thing. Um, but anyway, so I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm doing this spell and I'm like pouring my drops of rain water into the earth. And my brother is standing under this massive uh, tree branch that's overstretching our lawn. And at one point, I did the spell and I, you know, waited a couple seconds and no cap, a bolt of lightning came out from the sky. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Came down from the sky, struck the tree branch, and fell right in front of my brother. Okay, let's do it when we get outside, Dave. And, like, and I was like, all right, well. I did the spell wrong, obviously, because I created lightning instead of rain. But you I needed made a lightning. different dew drop. That dew drop I was a little got, tainted. And that was my thing. I was like, oh, that dew drop was wrong. I know. The tap water was filtered. Something must oh, be wrong. Oh, no, not the filter. It's a Brita filter. It ruins it all. And so, um, and so that's why I wanted to be a conductor, because I always love like doing things with my, with my hands, and especially choral conducting. Choral conducting is so fun. Uh, because you're not restricted necessarily by a baton. So every hand shape that you create can somehow do something different. Like the perspective, it's a very much like dancing, just with my upper body. I can't dance, as you've seen at the club. Um, but my upper body, like my hand specifically, everything reads differently. Like whether it's a gesture like this or something more outstretched, like this coming towards you is different from this coming out of you. These hands moving in the same direction is different than them moving in opposite directions, right? So it's just fascinating what different things can do and how they influence people. 
And so, anyway, all that to say that uh, to be the serious side of making it would be to be put in a position where it, the, all those stigmas don't matter. Where they'll be like, hey, I want you to conduct the New York Phil, um, and I know you'll do a fantastic job. Um, yeah, what about you? Yeah, mine is like, definitely if I like hear a crowd like the size of like Bowery Ballroom or something, of like 400-ish oh, yeah. people like singing back my song to me, that would be, I'd line. be like, yeah, <laughs> no, I'd just sing line. 400 people singing line. And then a funny one that I like really, really want to happen. Maybe in this year. No, no, no. That would never happen, I feel like. Okay, it'll get there maybe. Maybe I, I say next year confidently. So maybe this could happen. But I, yeah, my silly goal is for someone to throw a bra at me on stage. And for me to successfully catch it and keep it for life. And I'll frame it and embroider it with the date that it happened. <laughs> A bra. A bra. That's fine. How do you even get one to do that? What do you mean? Are you kidding? People just do that. Is that crazy? I've I would. I mean, I wouldn't be sacrificing my bra. But like, <laughs> people do that. They just like bring their extra bra, or they bring their bra and they like rip it off and throw it to the person oh, on stage. Oh, I thought you meant like the. No, you no, said no, bring no. an extra bra. Yeah, they do that. Like I've, if they don't want to. I've been take to one off. concert in my life. <laughs> I mean, I have no if experience. Monoskin was there, I'd consider it. I'd consider bringing my least favorite bra and being like, for you, Victoria. <laughs> Do you get nervous? Did. I never asked you this. Yeah, I was so, I was so bad. I almost like threw up before performances. I would get like super shaky knees, like on stage. I'd be like, <laughs> I couldn't stand properly. And I'd be like so out of breath just because I was like really anxious. Um, and then like by like the last song, I'd finally be like, oh, okay, cool. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze again. You and the sneezing. No, it's so in there. Cause it's like, it's Hop like. Hop and drill when you get home. But I've been getting better at it. I think like with my team now, like for the first time, um, or just like over the past eight months, like I've been growing my team and I have a manager and a lawyer and an executive producer and kind of like another bigger manager kind of person now. And um, it's really weird. It's like so weird to be like, can you just, <laughs> can you handle this? Or like, you know, they like, I'm doing, I'm playing South by Southwest soon. And yes, you are. I am. <laughs> I'm so nervous, but I'm, I am excited. You'll be, you'll be great. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, my executive producer has like found the band, and my manager is like scheduling all the flights, and you know, and I'm like, what do I, <laughs> like, what do like, I do? I, I literally <laughs> like, no, literally, I'm like, what do I even do? So like, it's it's like super weird, and it's like slowly as this music thing becomes bigger and bigger, like my responsibilities um, become more artistic. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like really crazy to me and it's it's just accepting help, you know. Which is so, the place where you want to be, I right, think. Right. And it's funny, I, I'm literally I'm experiencing the same thing, right? Where I'm part of a chorus organization, or I'm part of two, right, where uh, my responsibilities are not the setting up chairs or where do people stand, yeah. or getting people their music, or anything like that. My responsibilities are the artistic. And for a while, when I first started these jobs, I thought, oh no, I can still help set up chairs, I can still help do this, and I do when it's needed. But I often find too, that somehow, and I'm, you've probably experienced this too, that just takes you out of the, the artistic space. Yeah. Like the minute you have to do something logistical, where you're like, oh, where am I gonna put this guitar stand? Or like, how was the balance? Or whatever it is. It's like, it just takes you out of the, the artistic space. And it's so freeing to be able to say, oh, this is this person's job to be the operations manager and to deal with all these logistical elements. And I get to go up here with the stick and say, yeah. all right, we're gonna start at measure 36. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Like, let's go. It's just so freeing and, and wonderful. And you know, you asked me a question before about knowing that you've made it. And I think that's part of it too, is knowing that you have a team of people that's willing oh, yeah. to support your artistic vision. <laughs> that's finally, <laughs> finally it happens. We've been waiting for that for like two hours. I did it in the bathroom, I was like. <laughs> <laughs> 